Good morning, folks. It is now 1030. So I think we're going to go ahead and get started. It looks like we have a pretty good group assembled thus far. Uh, I'm here to talk with you today about dispelling ICWA or ICWA myths. My name is Shannon Dennison. I am an AIC or attorney in charge with the Department of Justice. I manage the attorneys with Department of Justice who practice out of our Salem office, but I also have the honor of being able to represent and advise the Tribal Affairs Unit. Uh, and I'm very excited to be able to join you today to talk about this topic. Before I get started, I do want to mention that my comments today are not those of the Attorney General or of the DOJ, they are my own. Before we launch into our discussion of ICWA myths, um, Emily Hawkins had asked me to also talk with you a little bit about the or ICWA resource group that we have put together in CHAZ. So I am, I'm gonna uh, start by uh, sharing a little PowerPoint that I've put together that talks about our or ICWA resource group. Um, so uh, it, some of you may already be familiar. Let's see, am I not sharing? Let's see. All right, now I'm sharing the uh, screen. Uh, so uh, it, after the implementation of ORICWA, we started to realize that it, uh, we were getting a lot of questions uh, from AEGs and uh, uh, caseworkers about ORICWA compliance. And uh, certainly as our office has expanded, I, I'm sure many of you on this call know that we've taken over full representation uh, with DHS so that we're appearing at every court appearance from case opening to case closure uh, and every point in between uh, that we've uh, dramatically increased our staff and our AEGs. And we wanted to ensure that we had a, a, you know, adequate support for folks to be able to troubleshoot, um, and address questions with, with others within our section. And with over 90 attorneys, it's a, it, that's probably a bit more than I can consult with on a daily basis. So we've put together what we're calling the ORICWA Resource Group, and I'm gonna introduce um, these folks to you here, not in person, but via uh, photographs. So again, uh, who is the, or what is the ORICWA Resource Group? We're a, a, a resource group made up of AEGs, assistant attorneys in charge, and attorneys in charge who have agreed to volunteer their time to assist their peers to ensure that they're learning about ICWA and ORICWA, so we're doing trainings, uh, and also to help ensure that uh, ICWA and ORICWA requirements are followed in every case that we're litigating in juvenile court. Um, so just to let you know a little bit about uh, who those folks are and how to contact them, uh, who your contacts may be, depending on where you are in the state, uh, let's take a look at our individual offices. So first of all, we have five attorneys out of our Portland uh, Child Advocacy Office, or CHAZ office, and that includes Carmen Brady Wright, uh, and Rahila Raymond and Catherine Terwilliger, who are all attorneys in charge. We also have AEGs, Mary Margaret Montgomery and Lauren Kemp. So hopefully if you're in the Portland area, you're familiar with some of these faces and you'll know that these are uh, folks who can consult on uh, ICWA cases, talk about it or ICWA compliance if there are questions there. In our uh, Salem, Bend, and T Pendleton teams, you have me, uh, Shannon Tennyson, in the, I am an attorney in charge again in Salem. Uh, and then John Anderson is our AIC for both the Pendleton and Bend CHAZ offices. And Caitlin Canope is the assistant attorney tr in charge who works with both me and John in Bend and in uh, Salem. So Caitlin is also a contact and we have AEG Holly Ferrioli who also straddles both uh, Bend and Salem. Uh, and then out of our Lane uh, Chaz office and our Medford Chaz office, we have Michelle Watkins who is the AIC for uh, the uh, Lane Chaz office uh, or Eugene Chaz office and Carmen Brady Wright, who you saw up in Portland, she is also the AIC for our Medford Chaz office. Kim Bolin is an AAG in Medford and she is also on our team. And then just to give you a little graphic, I, I stole this idea from Ashley. This, this is such a great idea that she did with her, uh, 
uh, equa resource specialists. And so I thought I would uh, steal this idea and use it here for our uh, Oracle resource group. So uh, you can see uh, we, we do have folks sort of clustered around where we have Oregon tribes, but we're primarily, you know, as we, we're really all available to assist in any county anywhere in the state. We're not sort of limited to these geographical areas, but we, we try to pr focus our attention and our availability to attorneys in these areas um, in the offices that we share because we already have those relationships, but really any one of us can be available to assist and consult on cases anywhere in the state. Um, I also have a slide here with our contact information and uh, Emily will have, uh, I will be sending this information to Emily and to Christine. And so uh, if you would like to have access to this PowerPoint and have all of our contact information, please feel free to reach out to them. And that is it for our discussion of the ORICWA resource group. And then I am going to go next into talking about dispelling ICWA and ORICWA myths. Before I do, does, does anyone have any questions just about the ORICWA resource group? Okay, fantastic. All right, so uh, I was excited when I was asked to do a presentation on myths because I immediately had this idea of, oh, let's put together <laughs> Uh, a, a presentation with some fun photos of myths and legends and things like that can help set the backdrop for our talk today. Uh, so first of all, let's talk a little bit about what a myth is. And uh, we always have myths in juvenile dependency cases. A myth, of course, is uh, something that has um, that has gained this uh, sense of truth. It's based ostensibly in historical events. Uh, it uh, it forms people's worldview, their beliefs about uh, certain issues or practices, um, and it, it begins to sort of form the foundation for how we're doing our work, even though it is false, <laughs> it's not real. And uh, so it's very important that we dispel these myths um, before they become ingrained practices. I'm sure you've all seen myths unfolding cases because information in maybe a, a psychological evaluation or a parenting note or parenting training note is, is entered incorrectly. And then it becomes a, a myth or a legend in the case because people forever associate it with that case. I once had a case where uh, for whatever reason, the judge of a case kept confusing case facts from a particular day when she heard shelter hearings, and she was certain that the mother in the case had threatened the lives of her children, and at each and every hearing, she would open the case by saying, oh, this is that case where the mother threatened the life of the children, and then we all had to say, no, no, that's not this case, judge, that's not this, and yet she couldn't get it out of her mind. It was a myth that just grabbed hold of her brain, and she couldn't shake it. And it was unfortunate because she began every hearing with the assumption that this mother had done something that she hadn't done. Uh, so very important to move away from these myths uh, because they can um, inappropriately shape our thinking and the actions that we take. So let's jump into the first myth that I've established uh, for today. And I started with this myth because it comes up on such a uh, frequent basis since we've implemented ORICWA. And this first myth is that we can't do protective actions in an ICWA case. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard caseworkers and even AEGs say that, and or AEGs coming to me and saying, well, DHS is telling me that we can't do a protective action plan. Not only can we do a protective action plan, but the process for how uh, you do a protective action plan is outlined in your rule. All you have to do is go to your rule, check it out. Let's take a look at what it has to say. Um, so first of all, we know we can do protective action plans in non equa cases, right? So we look at the definition for what that protective action plan would be in a non equa case. An immediate same day short term plan lasting a minimum of 10 calendar days that is sufficient to protect a present danger safety threat. Well, similarly, we have a definition for uh, a protective action plan in a non equa case. And it's right in that, it's embedded right in that same definition uh, in su subsection B. And that the first definition that I just reviewed with you was subsection A, immediately following it is subsection B. And then you can also find the same definition in the equal rule. 
But a protective action plan similar to in a non-equa case is a, an immediate same day short-term plan lasting a maximum of 10 cal calendar days. Um, oops, uh, <laughs> I just realized that uh, somehow when I brought the language over here, we've brought the wrong definition, which is unfortunate. So I'm gonna get you the actual definition because that is not the correct de definition and I'm not sure how I did that. But we're going to fix that, uh, and I am going to tell you. Um, <laughs> that is so embarrassing. I hope you're all getting a good laugh from my mistake there. Let's get you the actual definition. And uh, a sufficient to protect a child from an immediate, uh, or sorry, an imminent physical damage or harm without removing the Indian child from either parent or custodian. Uh, so I am going to correct this for this <laughs> for this uh, PowerPoint, and then I'll shoot that to Emily, and then you will all have access to this with the correct definition laid out here. I don't know how I cut and pasted that and never caught it before uh, this moment, but there you have it. So the only difference here, again, is an immediate uh, same day uh, plan, but the difference is um, the the um, what the the, what we're protecting from, the because the standard is different, the, what we're protecting from is an, an immediate uh, physical damage or harm to the child. And then we have that added criteria that it, uh, it, we, it must be able to be implemented without removing the Indian child from either a parent or an Indian custodian. So then let's take a look to down at your rule, uh, emergency removal and return upon demand. Uh, similarly, it says the DHS can develop a protective action plan uh, in which the Indian child remains with the parent or Indian custodian or in an in-home initial safety plan um, per the requirements of your PS rules to ensure child safety. So you may absolutely implement a protective action plan. I think that what's difficult for people to wrap their heads around is that the child must remain in the care of one or both parents. It doesn't have to be both, but it can be either parent or an Indian custodian, if you, have, if you happen to have an Indian custodian in your case. Often we do not have an Indian custodian. But if the child is, stay, is with one of those three people, then you can proceed when you're with your protective action plan. If your plan involves you, DHS, saying uh, to the family, we are requiring that the child be out of the care of either a parent or an Indian custodian, that is a removal. You are no longer in a protective action plan or a family plan, you are in a removal. Um, you can have a family plan, a protective action plan or a removal uh, regarding an Indian child, but it's really important for you to think about um, who, whether or not you are you DHS are mandating the plan or the family is coming to you with the plan and then what the details of that plan may be if you are the one implementing in, uh, the, the plan and setting out requirements for the plan. And, and if you are the one setting out the requirements for that plan, then uh, the plan uh, must involve the child remaining with one or both parents or with an Indian custodian. I'm just gonna look over here to see, do I have any questions about that one before we move on to the next myth? Uh, because I think that is the most, the issue that comes up for me the most. And my apologies about that rule, I'm gonna fix it for you in the slide so you will have the correct one uh, if it's posted to the OWLS page. All right, let's go on to our next myth. Uh, this one comes up a surprising amount. Oh, we, we don't need to plead any allegations about a dad who's not a legal dad uh, it, with it, when it's an um, Indian child. If it's a non-legal dad, we don't need allegations about him. I hear that all the time. And, and you know, he's not legal, he's not a Stanley, he looks more like a pagan. Um, and so we're, we're not gonna plead any allegations about him. 
Not so uh, with ORICWA. Remember that ORICWA made some changes around parentage. So let's talk about that. So uh, the definition of parent under ORICWA is biological parent of an Indian child, no surprise there. Uh, someone who's adopted the child, no surprises there. But then we also have a dad whose parentage has been acknowledged or established under 109.065 or 419.B609. So let's take a look at what that language says. That language says that a man's parentage has been acknowledged or established if uh, he's established it under 109.065. That's all of the, you know, uh, judicial determination, joint paternity affidavit, all the other ways in which we can legally establish someone as a parent, or he can be established under tribal law or tribal custom, or see, and take a look at that subsection D, if he acknowledges orally or in writing to the court, DHS, or a licensed uh, Oregon adoption agency. So if, if, he, if he raises his hand and says, I believe I'm the dad, even if up until that moment, he's really looked more like a pagan, he's not been a Stanley and he's not legal, uh, we need to consider him to be a parent. He is a parent under the statute at that point, unless and until the court determines that he is not. And how does the court determine that he is not? Well, that's when we kick into our 609 subsection two requirements around blood testing. So once he is acknowledging uh, or his belief that he is the father of the child, uh, either, uh, either, he, either he is doing that to the court or we, DHS or DOJ, are telling the court that he has acknowledged to DHS that he believes that he's, he's the father, then the court will uh, has 30 days to order uh, DNA parentage testing. And uh, he must comply with that DNA parentage testing within a reasonable amount of time and what constitutes a reasonable amount of time will be determined by the court. Uh, and then the outcome of those tests will be dispositive of his parentage. So if it says he's the dad, he's the dad. If it says he's not the dad, then he's not the dad. If he refuses to comply, then the court can make a finding that he has refused to comply and can then determine that he is not going to be considered to be a parent for the purposes of our juvenile dependency case. So if- Shannon, we have a quick question. Um, from I think the slide before, I wanted to jump in before you got into the parentage part. Um, got it. So um, the question is, if the child is with the parent that is not native, um, mm -hmm. is the protective action plan still allowed? Absolutely. Always remember that ICWA and or ICWA attaches to the child. Um, not a parent, it attaches to the child. The inquiry is always whether or not the child is an Indian child. And when we're thinking about all the uh, provisions of the ICWA, we're always thinking about the uh, you know, how it pertains to the child. So, um, and, and we'll get to, the, we'll talk a little bit more about this later when we're talking about um, uh, extended family, but it doesn't matter if the, the, you know, the, the idea, the goal of ICWA and or ICWA is to prevent the uh, unnecessary breakup of the Indian family. And so the, the child's family is both mom and dad. Uh, no matter who is or is not a member of a federally recognized Indian tribe. And, and is also the grandparents and other relatives. Um, but so as long as the child is remaining with mom, dad, uh, you know, any a parent or an Indian custodian, it doesn't, for the Indian custodian, of course, they're going to have to be an Indian custodian to meet that definition has to be a member of a federally recognized tribe. Um, but for the parents, it doesn't matter which which parent we're placing with, or I'm not going to use the word placing, but which <laughs> which parent with whom the child continues to reside. That's a great question. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to move back to parentage, and I, I just want to really remind everyone, because this is kind of for me a couple of times in the past couple of months, which is why I wanted to include it and I wanted to include it early in the presentation. Uh, I've seen a number of cases where folks have just said, well, we just didn't include him in the petition because he's not, uh, uh, yeah, he's not legal and he hasn't really been around that much. But he is a man orally acknowledging to DHS that he believes himself to be the father. 
And then that kicks in DHS's requirements to treat him as a parent, put him in the petition, notify the court that he believes he's the father and to seek, uh, ask the court to order that DNA parentage testing. So very important to remember um, those dads. Okay, let's move on to our next myth. If we don't hear from the tribe, then ICWA doesn't apply. I, I can't tell you, th this is not a new myth. This is a myth that I've been hearing about for more than 20 years. Well, we sent our inquiry letter to, to the tribe and we just never heard back. So we're just not gonna treat it as an ICWA case. And I, I've often heard this coming more from defense counsel and from judges than I have uh, from DHS, but, but I, I hear this a lot of, oh, come on, the tribe hasn't responded. That, that means that it's not an equal case. Whether or not the tribe has responded is, is not the standard. <laughs> the, the standard, we have to confirm whether or not the, I mean, the child is, is a member or is eligible for membership with the tribe and is the biological child of a member. That's the question we need answered. And until we have that question answered, if there's reason to know that the child's an Indian child, we have to treat it as an equal case. And it may take a long time. Some tribes have a lot of resources and are available to respond to us, some are not. And sometimes, there could be some problem in, in uh, the inquiry that we've sent to the tribe. Maybe they haven't received it. Maybe we sent it to the wrong office. Uh, but if we're not getting a response, the the um, the appropriate resolution is not to, you know, throw our hands in the air and say, well, I guess the child's not an Indian child. It's to um, take a look at what our communication has been with the tribe and address that and ensure that we're getting in touch with the tribe and answering the right questions. So uh, let's just take a look at what the law requires. So if the court, and this is taken pretty much straight from ICWA, but, uh, but uh, we went beyond ICWA's requirements around inquiry in or ICWA, which is great, uh, because I think it provides a lot of clarity that was much needed. But let's take a look at what's required. If the court has reason to know the child is an Indian child, as I said earlier, um, uh, but the court doesn't know yet. They, they have reason to know, but it's still an unanswered question. Um, the court must treat the child as an Indian child. That means they have to apply all the standards that are required. Uh, they have to take QEW testimony. Every element of the ICWA applies if the court um, has reason to know the child's an Indian child. Until the court determines on the record that the child does not meet the definition of Indian child. The court can only do that with evidence. The court can only make that determination that the child doesn't meet the definition with evidence and um, no response is not evidence. That's a, a lack of evidence. <laughs> the only evidence that can answer that question is a definitive response from the tribe. Um, the, and the court also must in, uh, require DHS, um, and it says or another party because it may, DHS may, could theoretically not be the moving party, but they typically are, as we all know, uh, to support a report, declaration, or testimony on the record that they've used due diligence to identify and work with all tribes, uh, with, of which there's a reason to know the child may be a member. Um, so I know uh, Christine Camps worked very hard on uh, DHS's inquiry process to avoid what used to happen long, long ago, which is an inquiry letter would be sent and we would patiently wait and wait and wait and wait, and maybe not ever get a response. And then eventually someone would say, well, I guess it's not an Indian child. But now we've got really great uh, DHS uh, procedures around how the inquiry process will operate. Um, so be sure that if you ever have any questions about that, you're taking a look at DHS's inquiry procedures. Let's move to our next myth. Um, to comply with notice requirements. Uh, DHS just needs to, to mail a letter to the tribe telling them that a case has opened. Um, and I hope, I, by the way, I really liked this slide. I hope you all like my werewolf uh, for this myth slide. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, um, it, I, unfortunately, I thought that we had this one uh, under control, but recently, in the past couple of months, I did see a notice that appeared uh, or that was intended to be sent out. It hadn't yet been sent out yet. So we caught it before it was sent out, but it was just going to be just a letter sort of saying, hey, we, we're opening a case and we have a hearing set on this date. And that's all it said. It was not a proper uh, ICWA notice in that it did not comply 
with uh, either the federal regulations or our state law around what needs to be included in an ICWA notice. Um, so let's talk about what needs to be, you know, how that notice happens and what it needs to be. So before we can, uh, before the court can conduct a hearing on a petition um, in an, an ICWA child custody proceeding, and that's a, a dependency case, so a jurisdiction case, it could be a guardianship, it could be a termination of parental rights case. Before the court can conduct any kind of substantive hearing on the case, the moving party must serve notice on the parent, tribe, and any any Indian custodian that may be involved. And that notice must be sent by registered or certified mail with return receipt requested. And the last notice to be received by those people entitled to notice, so you know, parent, tribe, Indian custodian, must have been received at least 10 days before our hearing. Um, what I don't have on the slide, and I'll just mention, um, all of those individuals can ask for an additional 20 days to prepare for the hearing. But in any event, the piece I want you to definitely remember is that we cannot appear and do anything substantive on that petition until that notice has been served by registered or certified mail with return receipt requested at least 10 days before the hearing. Uh, when we do appear and, and we wanna proceed, how is the court gonna know that we did that? How's the court gonna know that we provided that notice by registered or certified mail 10 days before? Well, we, the, or the moving party, is going to file an original or a copy of each notice that was sent with the court together with any return receipts or other proof of service. Okay, so it's very important um, that we demonstrate to the court by filing those proofs uh, or receipts to demonstrate to the court that, that folks receive notice um, per the statute's requirements. And what does the notice include? Well, it's pretty lengthy. And this is why um, I'm always concerned about a letter going out because a letter almost never con contains all the information that you're about to see on the next slide. All right, that's a lot of tiny language on your screen. I'm not gonna read it all to you, don't worry. <laughs> but there's a lot of requirements that must go into the legal notice to make it a valid notice. You'll notice I did highlight one item in blue and that's a copy of the petition initiating the proceeding. And the reason I say that is I've seen a couple of times where folks have said, before we've even filed the petition, I've heard, oh, we already sent a notice to the tribe. And my response is, I, I know with certainty that you did not send a valid notice to the tribe because for it to be a valid notice, it must include a copy of the petition that's initiating the proceeding. And if we've not yet filed the petition, you've not completed notice. So we're gonna have to do it again. And um, so if you have, have any questions, please talk with your AAG. Your AAG should be uh, either, you know, our office, DOJ, should be drafting each and every notice that goes out in Oregon. If you have an arrangement at your branch where your office is drafting the notices, the AAG must review it top to bottom to ensure uh, that it's accurate before it goes out. So no notice should go out um, to any parent, tribe, or any Indian custodian in any ICWA case in Oregon without an attorney having fully reviewed it. So, um, so please be sure that either you're having your DOJ office do it or you're working lockstep with your AEG to ensure that they're reviewing it. Shannon, quick question on that one. Um, yeah. In terms of the certified mail, what if you have a parent who is houseless um, that you're needing to serve and so does that mean also that a hand-delivered petition um, and proof of service would not count? Um, it, it does count. So let's talk about how it counts. And thank you, Stacey. That's an excellent question because that comes up a lot, right? And we, we know that that's a, often a problem. So um, if we have a parent um, who is, um, you know, who doesn't have housing, maybe they're bouncing around. We have a couple of options on how we can proceed. Um, so the, the federal regulations uh, do provide that we can buttress that service of the notice by registered or certified mail with personal service. Personal service is not a substitute for sending the notice by registered or certified mail. Um, but they can be done together. 
So the the importance, I mean, I think what, what both the federal and state statute are really trying to get at is we want to ensure that the parent is getting this notice and that they're either signing off for it or they're physically receiving it. Uh, and the requirement for registered or certified mail um, helps ensure that, that that no one's being dishonest, no one's faking anything, uh, that it's being sent and an, an external third party is documenting that they've received it. So uh, I would say go ahead and send your registered and certified mail um, at, at, to the last known address. But if we know where they are, we can also uh, personally serve them and then we can file both whatever receipt comes back and, and that receipt may come back as undeliverable or no, no longer at this address, what have you. But we'll also have our, um, our proof of service from the personal service and we'll file both of those with the court. Um, and there may also be circumstances where we have a parent, may, maybe it's that they're houseless, maybe it's that we don't know where they are, right? And so we, we all know that happens, that we have cases open and, you know, uh, mom hasn't seen dad in six years. She doesn't know, he could be, you know, he could be in South Carolina, he could be in another country. We have no idea where he is, he could be anywhere. And uh, so both the uh, federal and state law do provide that if we cannot ascertain the, um, either the identity or the whereabouts of a parent, um, tribe or Indian custodian, the BIA is supposed to be able to assist us in uh, locating them. They, I, I will just tell you that often the response we get from BIA is, "We can't, we can't help you. We don't, we don't know what to do with this." Uh, I just encountered that earlier this week. But we, we, what we will do is we will send the notice, and the process is all laid out in the federal regulation and in the state statute. We'll send the notice to the tribe along with a letter saying hey, we're unable to locate the identity, uh, or sorry, the whereabouts of this one parent, um, can you assist us? And then, uh, and we send that to the BIA by registered or certified mail with return receipt requested. The BIA then has 15 days to either uh, serve the parent, you know, locate them and serve them, to notify us that they are going to be unable to, to locate them and serve them, or, to tell us they do think they can serve them, um, but they haven't been able to find them yet and they can request more time. So they need to let us know within 15 days, one of those three things. If they tell us the third thing, that last thing that they need more time, um, they can specify for the juvenile court how much time, additional time they need. But at that point, per the regulations, the court may go ahead and proceed on a jurisdictional matter, um, even without, uh, having that answer from the uh, BIA. Once we do get um, the uh, the final response from the BIA, either that they were able to successfully serve the notice or that they couldn't find them, we need to file that information with the court, um, but we can still proceed on our case at that point. So you may have a parent who we know where they are, but they just don't have a reliable address, or you may have a parent um, who we don't know where they are. And so, and we have a, a legal avenue we can pursue with either circumstance. Any other questions about that? Does that answer your question, Stacy? Yes, um, I have one more. If you're able to um, personally serve all parties and they're in agreement, can you move the hearing up or do you still have to wait the 10 days? You have to wait the 10 days. There's no um, provision for a waiver of the 10 days. Um, very good question. Thank you, Stacy. All right. Um, another one of my favorite slides here. I, I will tell you um, that I showed this slide to my husband and he said, I'm sorry, Santa is not a myth. And so, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, but I used Santa anyway, because I loved this picture of him on the beach. Uh, so let's review this myth. Uh, tribes and Indian custodians only receive discovery if they've intervened. Um, I am a, a little bit concerned. I keep hearing a lot of language circulating about, about tribes intervening and, and what folks think that means. And I keep, I, uh, um, it ha which lets me know that folks still don't know that in Oregon, that uh, even without intervention, a tribe is a party to our cases now, now under ORICWA. 
That's not true under ICWA. This is one of those things that we did in ORICWA that goes above and beyond the requirements of ICWA. So in Oregon, and this definitely is not true in the rest of the country, in any juvenile dependency child custody proceeding, the, the tribe and the Indian custodian are a party. There is a provision under statute where they can say, hey, you know what, I don't wanna be a party. <laughs> and they can withdraw from party status if they so desire. But the default is party status. So please remember this. And please remember it when you're working with out-of-state tribes because they don't necessarily know what we've done in Oriqua. Um, so please be sure that you let them know when you're working with an out-of-state tribe that you are already a party. You don't have to take any additional steps or make any additional efforts or expend any funds uh, in order to get any particular status. They can still intervene and that's great and that's fine. They have an absolute right to, to intervene, but that doesn't change their party status. They are a party unless they withdraw from party status. And uh, so I've provided you uh, the language there from the um, new language that we have in 419B 875, parties to the proceedings include the Indian Child's tribe and the Indian Child's Indian custodian. Um, and then our discovery statute in Oregon is 419B 881. And uh, I've, this is, please know that this is not the entirety of the discovery statute. It's much longer than that. But I didn't think that anyone in this meeting would want to review the entirety of the discovery stat statute. So I've kind of summarized uh, some of the highlights for you, which is in all juvenile dependency and TPR proceeding, each party must disclose to each other party you know, names, addresses, uh, and any uh, statements made by anyone they intend to call as a witness, um, any other uh, written or recorded statements made by a parent or child to any other party, reports, statements of experts who will be called as a witness, and all books, papers, documents, photographs that the party intends to offer into evidence in the hearing. And so uh, if the, uh, if we have and a case in which ICWA and ORICWA apply, there's nothing, you don't need any special um, permission uh, or consultation with your attorney to provide discovery to the tribe or to the Indian custodian. They automatically get it. Please ensure that they are receiving discovery. Um, I One point I do want to highlight is sometimes we've had some issues with discovery being provided to out-of-state tribes. Um, they're always a little bit disadvantaged because they don't have ex access to our through OECI and our file and serve and all of that. Um, so just be aware that that might be an issue. Please don't assume um, that because you filed a court report that the tribe has gotten it. Please ensure that the tribe is getting court reports and uh, and the, the same applies, of course, for our AEGs um, who are submitting discovery to parties. We need to ensure that uh, we're including tribes and Indian custodians and all of that. Any questions about discovery? Okay. Okay, let's move on to our next one. Um, this is one that comes up a lot. Uh, ICWA or ICWA placement preference requirements are satisfied if the child's placed with a relative. As long as we're with a relative, we're good. We're good to go. Um, one of the things that has um, been a, a, a challenge is re reminding folks that before we ever get to the requirements laid out in ICWA and or ICWA uh, for placement, that, that's member or placement with a, a member of the extended family in a foster home, uh, license approved specified by the tribe, a foster home license or approved by the tribe, or an institution for children suitable to meet their needs and is approved by an Indian tribe or operated by an Indian organization, that before we ever get to that list of placements, we're first supposed to go to the tribe directly and, and ask if the tribe has their own order of preference uh, for placements for their child citizens that differs from the Oregon, or sorry, from the ICWA or ORICWA placement preferences. And they might. Many tribes adopt the ICWA placement preferences and their placement, those placement preferences align, and that's fine. And in that event, a, a placement with a relative is going to satisfy that requirement in that case. 
But we've had a number of cases where we place with a relative and we just assume that that's fine uh, without regard for exactly who that relative is. And, and then we find out six months down the road, a year down the road or longer, that the tribe actually had their own priority of placement. They already had their own tribal resolution. Maybe it was in their uh, tribal code. Maybe it was a, some sort of tribal resolution um, that specified that, you know, maybe you first looked at the maternal grandmother and then the paternal grandmother, and then you could look at other relatives or what have you. But they they actually have it specified what which relation you look to in which order. So if if we didn't ask the tribe what their order of preference was, and we didn't follow their preference, then we're actually not in compliance with either or ICWA or ICWA. Um, where it's confusing a bit if you open up the ICWA statute is that that information about the tribal resolution comes after the information about those four preferred placements. Um, so I think sometimes people read those four preferred placements and then they stop reading <laughs> and they don't get to that part about the uh, tribal resolution. In Oregon, we decided to flip it in Oracle to make sure that we highlighted that for every uh, uh, placement of an Indian child, we're looking for a placement that most closely approximates a family, uh, that allows um, the child's special needs to be met, is in reasonable, pro reasonable proximity to the child's home, and, and then that this is where we highlight it, is in accordance with the tribe's placement preference. And only if they don't have their own established placement preference, then we go to this order of placement in the following, you know, one, two, three, four order. Shannon, what if the tribe doesn't have an official established placement um, and ODHS has a relative they'd like to place the child with, but the tribe has a non-relative they'd like the child placed with, who would be the person to place? With. So if, if the tribe does not have, so you'll see that in the language I've highlighted in orange here, if the Indian child's tribe has not established uh, placement preferences, um, then we need to place in the following order, right, in these one of these four places. So the first order of placement would be with the relative that you've identified. But if you have the tribe coming to you and saying, actually, we, we kind of think that it should be, the child should be placed with this non-relative. We don't have our own staff. Then, then what the conversation that we need to have is whether or not the tribe is going to perhaps seek a, a good cause finding from the court to deviate from the placement preferences for whatever reason. And there may be a reason that we want to deviate from these placement preferences, right? We all know that, that we can seek a good cause finding to deviate from the placement preferences in certain circumstances. And sometimes the needs of the child may require um, a different order of placement. Let's say we have a child who has um, specialized medical needs and the tribe has a tribal placement available who has the medical expertise to meet the child's needs, but no one else in the family does, right? So the tribe may be coming to us and say, we actually would like you to, to place in this placement instead of with the relative. Um, uh, if in, in that circumstance, it might be that that person is a foster home licensed and approved by uh, the tribe, so we would need a good cause finding because we're still within the placement priorities. You only need the good cause finding if you're not going to place in one of those four. Um, but if it's a not a tribal member uh, and they're not licensed or approved by the tribe, um, we probably want to come in and get that good cause finding and establish uh, with the court why it is that we're going outside of the placement preferences. Where can you find a tribe's placement preferences? you'll have to ask the tribe. And that's one of the most important things when we realize we're working with a family. And as soon as we realize that we might be moving toward removal, we need to start having that conversation right away with the tribe about what are your placement preferences. There's no time like the present. Do not wait until the shelter hearing to talk with the tribe about their placement preferences because it's, then it's kind of too late, right? It, it, uh, so we, we, if we're out of compliance, you want to be um, talking with them as soon as you're aware that we might be moving toward removal. Um, it also may be, you know, getting away from placement preferences for a bit. Um, it may be that um, we can avoid removal altogether just by involving the tribe, right? So you should be collaborating with the tribe from day one anyway, because they may be able to come in and work with a family in a different way 
then DHS is able to work with the family um, and help get, establish um, practices in the home or um, structures in the home to ensure child safety and help support that parent in whatever they're going through. Um, and uh, we might not even need placement. But then if we do need placement, we have the tribe involved. We can be talking with them about what their placement expectations and requirements would be. Because if they have their own um, uh, order of placement, that's what we're following. We're using theirs, not ours. Okay. Let's go to our next myth. Um, uh, in that same vein, talking about placements, this has been something that's kind of newer, and I'm sure newer for all of you, is the topic of self-selected environments. And uh, uh, the question has come up a few times whether or not um, placement preference requirements apply with self-selected environments. And initially, we were finding that folks believed that it didn't apply. And the reasoning behind that was saying, well, a self-selected environment isn't a placement, it's an environment. And the placement preferences only apply when uh, the child is in need of placement with emphasis on the word placement. So as a legal team, we kind of reviewed this and we felt that the emphasis should not be on placement, the emphasis should be on is in need of. So let's take a look at what the language in the statute says is, if parental rights of an Indian child's parents have not been terminated and the Indian child is in need of placement or continuation in subcare, the child must be placed according to the or equal placement preferences. So typically we end up at a self-selected environment because the child is in need of a placement or, or continuation in subcare, but for whatever reason, they are unwilling to uh, maintain in those settings. And so we end up employing a, a self-selected environment for the child, but that doesn't mean that the child does not need placement or, or continuation in subcare. It just means that that has not been successful. And so we're looking to another um, option for the child. But those facts do not mean that for that Indian child, we uh, somehow now do not have to comply with the state or federal law around where a child may be when that child has been removed from a parent or Indian custodian. Um, therefore, if we're looking at a self-selected environment for an Indian child, please remember that we need a good cause finding. It's not that we can't do a self-selected environment. You can, you just need to get a good cause finding from the court um, and uh, if it, because that's necessary to allow the child to maintain in that self-selected environment. Otherwise we're not in compliance with the law around placement. Um, so remember, um, uh, D, uh, DHS does have its own internal procedure on how you go about seeking a good cause finding. Um, so remember that's a decision that's not gonna be made at the branch level. So if, if you have an Indian child and you're going to seek, a, or you believe you are going to need to seek a good cause finding for any reason, whether it's a self-selected environment or some other reason entirely, be sure you're following your internal procedure on how to seek that good cause finding. If you do not know how to do that, please be in touch with your, um, your uh, IPA resource. Um, why am I forgetting the, the name now? Not, not Regional IPA specialist. Regional IQA specialist, thank you so much, Stacey. Your regional IQA specialist or someone in the tribal affairs unit to talk about how you go about getting that good cause finding. Um, I have found that the DHS has been amazing about turning around those decisions or those, you know, those responses really quickly. We have been, got, and even sometimes within minutes, we've been able to uh, submit facts uh, to central office and get a turnaround from, uh, a, a, um, from Emily, Christine, right away. So um, it, it's not a big cumbersome and difficult process, but please be sure you comply with it. All right, let's move to our next. Um, this is, again, we're sort of still in placement land here talking about placement issues. Uh, and the, the myth here is if a person doesn't meet DHS's definition of extended family member, then the, we can't consider them to be a relative. They're not a relative. Um, and um, but I want everyone to remember that um, per both 
ICWA and ORICWA, so this is both a state and federal requirement, it, we must employ the tribe's definition of extended family member. So first and foremost, when we're thinking about who is a relative or a family member for an Indian child, we're looking to the tribe's law or custom uh, to give us guidance as to who may fall within that definition. And sometimes tribes have much more expansive definitions of uh, relative. I've never really seen a tribal definition um, that varies from DHS's that is more narrow. I suppose it could happen, I just haven't seen it. Um, but uh, remember that we're looking there first and it's only if the tribe does not have their own definition, either by law or custom for extended family member, then we look to your definition for a family member, which you'll see um, there on the slide. Any questions about that? Okay. It's a very quiet group today. So I've built in room for questions, but it's been very quiet. Um, okay, this, uh, uh, this myth um, is a very important one because I think people get really confused around this. I know even our AEGs sometimes have gotten confused around this. Um, so we've had some uh, changes around qualified expert witness uh, testimony in the way it's uh, laid out in statute with ORICWA. So let's take a look at the myth. Uh, once the child is a ward of the court in the temporary care or guardianship even of DHS, um, the DHS may remove the child from a parent without presenting qualified expert witness testimony. Um, that is false. Um, there is often this belief that we've got a kiddo in an in-home uh, plan with a parent, and maybe that's because the child has never been removed from the parent. Maybe it's because we affected a reunification. And then for some reason, for whatever reason, that, uh, that reunification was not successful. And now we're looking at a re-removal of the child. There's often this thought that what we need at that point is a shelter hearing and that at the shelter hearing, qualified expert witness testimony is not required. Both of those are wrong. We do not need a shelter hearing and qualified expert witness testimony is required. <laughs> so what we actually need is some sort of review hearing, a, a, a placement review hearing. And I know that all, you're all aware of your new policy that's been around for probably about a year now, that uh, even in, when it's not an ICWA case, if there's been a, a post-jurisdiction removal of a child, that DHS needs to ask for an expedited review hearing before the juvenile court um, and you know, hopefully that can be set within 24 hours, but that sort of depends on the court's availability and you know, in scheduling. Um, sometimes they're setting those hearings on the shelter docket, but that doesn't make it a shelter hearing. You only need a shelter hearing when you're seeking protective custody of a child. When you have guardianship of a child, that's a higher uh, level of authority. You don't need to go back down and ask for uh, protective custody. So when you initially get involved with the family, you have no legal status as to that child. Um, and then you either take protective custody through a protective custody order or by just removing the child uh, per your own authority under 419B 150. Um, and then after uh, you're going to be requesting temporary custody, another higher level of authority. And then once we establish jurisdiction, you have guardianship. You don't ever have to drop back down and ask for protective custody again. Once you have guardianship of that child, so we do not need a shelter hearing, but we do need an expedited review hearing. And at that expedited review hearing, we must present qualified expert witness testimony that continued custody of the child by the parent or Indian custodian is likely to result in serious emotional or physical damage to the child. You may only have a child, an Indian child in substitute care if, you have conducted an emergency removal and the court has found at your shelter hearing on the emergency removal uh, that it is necessary for the child to be placed in substitute care to prevent imminent physical damage or harm to the child. And that's at a preponderance of the evidence standard or at, at your post jurisdiction if uh, the child may be in substitute care only if we have proved that 
continued custody is likely to result in serious emotional or physical damage to the child at a clear and convincing standard, right? At a higher standard of proof. So those are the only two ways a child can be in care. If you don't have one of those present, that child cannot be in substitute care. So anytime, anytime uh, you are uh, separating a child from their parent or Indian custodian, you need to assess where, where you are legally in the case. Are you at that place where you have no legal status and we're gonna take protective custody? Well, then that's where the, the emergency removal standard at preponderance applies. Or do you now have uh, you know, guardianship of this child and you need to uh, go into court and prove the standard that's on your screen right now at a clear and convincing standard. So you'll be looking at where you are in the case to determine what you have to prove and at what standard. That was a lot of words and a lot of <laughs> legal words. Do, does anyone have any questions about when we need QEW testimony and what we have to prove and when? Okay, so I, I, I again, I, I recognize that was a lot of words, a lot of talking, but most important thing for you to remember is you're correct if you believe that QEW testimony is not needed at a shelter hearing. You're absolutely right about that. We don't need QEW testimony for a shelter hearing, but we're only in need of a shelter hearing when you have no legal relationship yet with the child. Once you have guardianship, you need a review hearing you're proving the standard that's on your screen right now, and we have to present QEW testimony. Okay, hopefully that's clear. If it is not clear, or if you continue to sort of chew on that through this meeting, and you wanna raise a question about it later, please feel free to raise your hand and let me know. All right. Um, this is a, a, a myth regarding inquiry. And uh, I'll just read it to you. Once we determine that ICWA or ORICWA does not apply, uh, inquiry regarding ICWA application is complete. We're done. We don't ever have to look at it ever again, <laughs> right? Uh, I, I think that's often the assumption. Once we uh, are done, we're done. Um, however, I think a, a lot of you have, uh, on the call have had some experiences over the past few years where um, a tribe's uh, eligibility um, standards have changed. So maybe a child who was not eligible at the start of the case becomes eligible for membership midway through the case. Um, but the fact that we determined that ICWA didn't apply at the start of the case doesn't then mean that the child cannot later become an Indian child if the tribe's enrollment standards change. Um, similarly, let's say that we have a um, a case where neither parent is uh, a member of a tribe um, and uh, the child is not a member of the tribe. So someone has to be a member, right? For the child to be an Indian child. The definition of Indian child is an unmarried person under the age of 18 who is either a member of a federally recognized tribe or is the biological child of a member. So if the child's not a member and the biological parents are not members, then the child uh, does not meet the definition of Indian child. But again, that status could change too. So we could have parents who are not members and maybe even at the start of the case, maybe they have no interest in becoming members for whatever reason. Maybe they're having some struggles and they're distancing themselves from their natural supports. But throughout the duration of the case, they come to see that actually that's not a healthy choice and that they want to become a member of their tribe, well, then the child is then an Indian child. So um, ICWA status can change. Um, so we want to be monitoring that and asking that all along. The other piece that I think is really important to remember is sometimes at the start of the case, parents may not provide us with accurate information and we may not be able to access accurate information. So maybe at the start of the case, the parents tell us, no, I, I'm not a member of a tribe and I don't have any tribal affiliation. I don't, I don't have any political status with any tribe. And then six months into the case, we end up finding grandma uh, and mom is estranged from grandma, hasn't talked to her in five years. 
And we talk to grandma and grandma goes, oh, actually, <laughs> mom is an enrolled tribal member. I enrolled her as a child when she was a baby, um, but she's been, you know, a, a out of contact. And I, you know, I don't know that she is really sort of aware of or even thinking about her tribal affiliation. Um, that can change the landscape as well is information discovered later that just wasn't accessible to us at the start of the case. So we may learn later um, that there's tribal affiliation that we didn't know about at the start. I had a case with almost that exact fact pattern that I just described uh, come to my attention about four months ago. And we had to sort of think about, oh my goodness, now we've got to really shift gears and think about what we're doing here. Um, because we absolutely had an Indian child and no one, not even the parents realized we had an Indian child. And we uh, realized uh, about midway through the case that we did. Um, in addition, you'll see uh, the new ORICWA requirements. And again, this is, um, you know, th this is a requirement of the court here, uh, but it demonstrates the concept that uh, it's, the inquiry is intended to be ongoing. So at the commencement of any hearing, in which the court is inquired or required to inquire, and that's really every child custody proceeding, the start of a jurisdictional proceeding, guardianship, TPR, adoption. Uh, the court must ask on the record each individual present whether or not they know or have reason to know that the child's an Indian child. Um, and if nobody knows or has reason to know, then the court must instruct each party to let the court know right away, immediately, if they later receive information that would suggest that there's that there's reason to know that the child's an Indian child. So you can see that that's, that's intended to be, um, or to, to acknowledge that information may come about later that would change the analysis of the child's status as an Indian child. Um, so again, just in summary, if at the start of the case, the child's not an Indian child, do not assume that that means they will not later become an Indian child during the life of the case um, with new information or changed circumstances. I also want to mention, I, oh, oh, Sarah has a comment. Shannon, uh, what do we do when we discover that midway through case post jurisdiction? How do we proceed with the court when we have a child in care who we have learned is an Indian child, but we didn't establish jurisdiction under those rules? Um, Sarah, I think that the question I'm referencing may be out of your branch, but I can't remember with certainty. Hold on, let me take a quick drink. Okay, my response to you, Sarah, you're gonna love it, it's it depends. And <laughs> it depends on a number of factors. Um, so I would say, uh, first of all, it sort of depends on um, sort of what has happened. And it, it, if it turns out your know, worst case scenario, if it turns out that DHS actually had information in its possession all along that there was reason to know the child was an Indian child, but misread it, misinterpreted it, um, lost track of it, and so we didn't treat the child as an Indian child, then we have a problem. Uh, then we know that we have violated like every aspect of the ICWA <laughs> and of our ICWA, and boy, there's kind of no way to sort of rectify that. And what we may need to do is dismiss and refile. Um, the vast majority of the time, though, I don't think that's what often happens. Often what happens is a, is a circumstance like the one I was describing earlier, where nobody knew the child was an Indian child. There was no information available to anyone. And in fact, we have case law um, around this very specific issue in Oregon. And I want to say the initials of the case are something like MG, but I could be completely mistaken about those initials and my apologies, but we do have case law uh, specifying that it's, you know, if, if it was impossible to have known that the child was an Indian child, we don't have to go back and redo everything. But from this point forward, we must comply with every element of the ICWA moving forward, including, I, you know, and I know it's gonna sound silly, because everyone's involved in the case, everyone has an attorney, everyone's been coming to court. I'm gonna say send those notices. Hey, yeah, clearly everyone knows about the case, but let's send those notices. <laughs> and we need to have, if the child is in care, we need QEW testimony for that child to remain in substitute care. And if we cannot 
demonstrate at a clear and convincing standard um, that uh, continued custody uh, with a parent or Indian custodian is likely to result um, in serious uh, physical or emotional damage or harm to the child, then we need to be talking about a reunification plan in short order to get the child home. So there's gonna be a lot of intense and careful planning once we find out that indeed we have an Indian child and we've not been complying. We wanna be getting the tribe on board. We're gonna to have to look at the, if, if, if the child does meet the standard to re, uh, remain in substitute care, we need to be looking at whether or not the placement comports with placement uh, preferences. Um, so as you can see, there's gonna be a whole lot of attention to detail. We're gonna to have to sit down and do a lot of planning to make sure that from that day forward, we're in compliance with ICWA and we need to quickly pull the tribe in very close <laughs> and be uh, following their lead on placement and uh, talking about uh, services and whether or not we've been providing active efforts and if not, what else would the tribe believe that we should be doing to be providing those active efforts? Um, so yeah, I think when uh, when that occurs, it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, there's a lot of I's to be dotted and T's to be crossed. So it's extremely important to bring in the child's attorney, bring in your AEG, bring in the parent's attorneys. We, we all need to get together um, uh, with the tribe uh, and figure out how we're going to proceed moving forward. You're very welcome, Sarah. <laughs> uh, the final bullet point that, well, it's second to the last bullet point on the slide that I wanna mention is that um, the inquiry, I'm sorry, that the, um, with each new child custody proceeding, we need to, to uh, renew our inquiry. Um, and I, I think one of the points, this has been lost a little bit in that um, the filing of, um, uh, a guardianship motion or petition. So for durable or permanent, we file a motion or, or a petition. Um, it is a new child custody proceeding. And we had a, um, an opinion JG that came out, um, I don't know, 2012, 2014, somewhere around there that clarified that that is a new child custody proceeding um, and so that means that um, everything that goes with it um, needs to be yeah, um, uh, affected. And, and I think we typically have been treating those as just continuations of the dependency case. And even though with a TPR, we were doing notice and QEW and all that, we weren't doing it with uh, guardianship. And so in the JG opinion, the Court of Appeals clarified that no, 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 no. This is a new and different kind of foster care proceeding um, in your guardianship because this is a, uh, it's a new layer of separation between parent and child that you're adding. And so in order to do that, you need to, um, you know, you, you are initiating a new child custody proceeding and you need to do everything around that that's required, including notice, QEW testimony, but we also need to be doing inquiry again. And I think that's one piece that's kind of been um, lost uh, along the way. And so I think we want to ensure that with guardianship and TPR, that we are again inquiring of the parent, do you believe you have, uh, uh, or is there any reason to know that the child may be an Indian child? Probably your answer is not gonna be different than it was at the front, but we, we wanna be asking that question again. Um, okay. Any other questions about um, uh, inquiry and, or what to do <laughs> if you find out that you have an inquiry case uh, midway through? No, okay. All right. Uh, and my final myth here is that ICWA is a race-based law and I have a very simple, simple um, response to this. I'm hoping that um, I've not been able to attend all of the ICWA conference with you, with you this year. I've been pulled in a lot of directions this week, um, but I hope that this has been part of your conversation. And I think, I, I know you've probably touched on a bit the Holland v. Brecking, Brecking case. And this is one of the uh, foundational issues in that Holland v. Brecking case is whether or not ICWA is an impermissible race-based law. And, um, it, it, 
th this is one thing that I think uh, proponents of ICWA have been very clear about um, since it was inception, that this is not about race. This is about a, a child's political status um, as a member or citizen of a federally recognized sovereign nation or tribe. Um, and our government's recognition of the harms that were done to uh, sovereign tribes and nations within the US borders um, by removal of children from safe, fit, healthy families um, and the uh, intentional and really, really explicit um, even putting, going so far as to put it in writing, the in, with the intent to destroy the language, the culture, um, and the you know foundations of tribal um, nations um, by pulling children away from their communities, pulling children away from their families, from uh, destroying all of their knowledge of their language, their religious practice, their culture. Um, family structure, just uh, and uh, the rec and because of that recognition of the incredible harms that were done to uh, tribes. To again, these are sovereign nations and tribes uh, that uh, that we had a duty as state and federal governments to um, repair these harms that um, that we perpetrated. All of our predecessors people who work for places called Department of Justice or Department of Human Services or Department of this or that, that all of our predecessors did to um, uh, Indian children and their families and their communities uh, as tribes, as political entities. Um, you know, we have government to government relationships with tribes, our US governments and our state governments with tribes, and we have failed to live up to our promises um, as a part of those government to government relationships. And it has profoundly harmed tribal communities. And ICWA is intended to undo those harms and to help tribal communities repair. And or ICWA and the other state ICWA statutes um, are designed to not only um, uh, embed those federal requirements into state law, but also to go above and beyond them and provide more protections, which I'm really glad to see that uh, Oroqua has done. You know, we've provided uh, greater protections for tribes, for parents, for kids um, in our uh, ICWA cases in Oregon. And But it, it's important to remember that it's not about race. If you look at any um, individual member of a particular tribe, each member of the tribe may have a different racial makeup. It's not about their race. It's about their political status as a member or citizen of the tribe. So um, that's, I just want to emphasize that point. It's been disheartening a bit, I, I think, for a lot of us to see some of the discussion the, on a nationwide scale about ICWA and its value. And um, so I hope that uh, you all walk away from this conference realizing that it's pretty critical um, that state actors and federal actors continue um, to try to repair the damage that really has been done to tribal communities. Um, and with that, that's my full discussion of myths today. And it looks like I st we still have 15 minutes to spare. So I'm happy to take questions on anything we've talked about today. I promise I am gonna go back and correct this slide. I I'm so embarrassed that I cut and pasted the same language for you twice, but I will fix that. Uh, but let me stop sharing my screen. And let's see. Um, see, see. Oh, I have a comment here from Lonnie Bass, if you're all looking in the chat. She says, my great grandmother and her sisters were removed to Chimawa school in the early 1900s. We are not able to be in the tribe they are from though, because we cannot prove they are from the Pitt River tribe. I'm so sorry to hear that, Lonnie. Thank you, Allie. Any other comments while we have a bit of time or questions?
Kristen says, I had a worker ask me about tribal notice for CRB. Should tribes be invited and notified about CRB? Yes, they should be <laughs> because the, the CRB really is a, I mean, I mean noticed. Uh, so what you mean by, uh, let's clarify what you mean by notice. So the notice that we talked about with all of the, the long laundry list of, of uh, information items that need to be, thank you, you said informed of, not invited to. Uh, yeah, they, uh, it, it doesn't have to be like the formal uh, ICWA notice, but uh, what I would refer to as notification. So uh, I would, um, I think in most of your counties, the court is sending out the, the notice of the CRB to all the parties, correct? And the, if the tribe is included as a party with the court in the court's information system, uh, the court should be sending out that CRB notice to the tribe as well. Is that happening? I don't know if that's happening, but I think that the court is obligated to send that to all parties and the tribe is a party. So I would say um, it, it would be good practice to confirm with the tribe if we know that we're gonna have a CRB to contact the tribe and confirm that they've received the notice from the court and if they have not, um, forward a copy of the notice to them and then maybe talk to your AG um, to have them follow up with the court and ensure that they're providing that notice to the tribe as well as the other parties. But it is, you know, it is the the CRB has the ability to make findings and recommendations that if nobody challenges, the court is going to be making or the court is going to be adopting. So it's, you know, it's really important that all parties be notified of, of the CRB and they have a meaningful opportunity to participate. Um, there's another comment. Uh, curious if you are hearing any myths around tribal customary adoptions. Oh my goodness. Well, I don't know about myths, but what I'll say is um, we're encountering, we're, we're discovering things that we didn't know in the legislative process when we were drafting uh, the, the statute around tribal customer adoption. So I'm, we're learning about a lot of things that aren't quite working the way we had hoped they would work. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give us an example for that. The statute is a bit sort of rigid in its language about home studies. Let me see if I can pull it up real quick um, in my handy dandy statute book and read for you. Uh, so one of the issues is um, it doesn't really talk a lot about, um, you know, how an out-of-state tribe is going to be able to conduct a uh, home study of uh, a tribal customary adoption, a, uh, adoptive resource who resides here in Oregon. So let's say we have a tribe in Florida and they want tribal customary adoption, but how are they supposed to do the home study? Because the statute says that the tribe, so like um, uh, if you look at the statute, it says um, the, the court shall accept a tribal customary adoptive home study conducted by the Indian child's tribe if the home study, and then it lays out all the requirements of what needs to be in the home study. All right, but it doesn't, it doesn't kind of pro provide some directions. It, it just, it's just sort of assumes that the tribe is actually conducting the home study. I think it would be really helpful if we could amend that language to clarify, you know, what the adoption, the tribal customary adoption home study needs to be. Now we know that the tribal customary adoption home study must be conducted. Um, and I'm sorry. Um, ah! was going to try to, oh, uh, using the prevailing social and cultural standards of the Indian Child's tribe as the standards for evaluation of the proposed adoptive placement. So then how do we do that in Oregon when the tribe is on the East Coast and here we are on the West Coast and the resources here in Oregon too? How, and if the tribe is not able to actually hands-on do the study, how do we do a home study using the prevailing social and cultural standards of the Indian child's tribe, because pretty sure that we don't have DHS staff who necessarily know uh, and are able to apply the prevailing social and cultural standards of every tribe in the US borders, <laughs> right? The, the, that's a lot of different uh, prevailing social and cultural standards. Uh, so there are a few uh, 
bits and pieces like that that could use a little bit of tweaking to help us kind of figure out what we're doing. Um, then we also had a couple of issues come up recently uh, with questions being posed about, well, what if there is a desire to uh, either from the child or the, uh, the adoptive resource to change the child's last name to align with the adoptive parent's last name, as is typically done in our traditional adoption. So in a traditional adoption, what would occur is that DHS would provide a list of vendor attorneys to the adoptive family. They would select a vendor attorney who represents them, represents the adoptive family in the adoption. They file the petition on behalf of the adoptive parents and they seek to change the name of the child. So that's typically done by a vendor attorney. In a tribal customary adoption, we don't do that for a couple of reasons. One, there's nothing for the adoptive parents to file. Uh, instead, the tribe files their own tribal customary adoption order or judgment in tribal court and then files it with us. And then we file it in state court or, or sort of a, a version. We, we file a, a state adopt, adoption judgment using uh, the, the tribe's order or judgment as the template for what um, constitutes the terms of the adoption, I guess also. But there's never a vendor attorney because the adoptive parent isn't filing anything. So uh, what do we do if there's going to be a name change? Well, uh, and then uh, typically in a tribal customary adoption, the parents are going to retain their parental rights. With tribal customary adoption, it is not necessary to terminate parental rights and typically we're not going to do that. Often we're proceeding with tribal customary adoption because the tribe opposes um, uh, termination of parental rights and instead prefers a tribal customary adoption plan. Uh, so we wouldn't be terminating parental rights. So we could change the child's name, but the parents may oppose that. So there's going to be a whole different process there. And who is going to be filing for the name change? Will it be the child? Is it the child's attorney filing for that? Is it the tribe? Is it DHS? That's a piece that we just didn't address at all in the legislative work group. And it, uh, it remains a bit murky how that process will go. If the child's name is changed, there have been questions about, well, what do we do with vital statistics and the birth certificate? And I've had a number of people say, well, after tribal customary adoption, do we need to add the adoptive parents to the birth certificate? But we wouldn't do that because the biological parents have retained their legal rights. They are still the legal parents. So we wouldn't be removing them uh, from the birth certificate. Even if we do change the child's name, we're still, they're still going to be legal parents. Now, there may be some circumstances where we're post TPR and then we decide that we're gonna proceed with trial or customary adoption. That would be a different story. But I think that's going to be rare. I think 99.9% .9 of the time, I'm, I'm gonna guess, uh, parental rights of the biological parents will remain intact uh, with the tribal customary adoption. A lot to think about. So there's, and those are just a couple of the things that we've found. <laughs> and we've only been working on two so far. Uh, we finalized one in Multnomah County. We have another one that we're working on now. Uh, and uh, so, uh, oh, and I should tell you that uh, uh, Representative Sanchez did ask to meet with DHS and DOJ and tribes to kind of take a look at um, what has and has not been working with tribal customer adoption and see if we can um, make some improvements. Might not be in 2023. It might be, uh, you know, in a later legislative session, but just good for you all to know that folks are talking about it. Folks are aware that there are issues and we're working through them. Someone just sent me a direct message that said, if a tribe doesn't have official Indian custodian paperwork, can they still, can a parent still designate an Indian custodian if they fit within the legal boundaries? Okay, so two things. Um, thank you for asking the question because I think people get real confused about what an Indian custodian is. So there is no Indian custodian paperwork and there is no designation of an Indian custodian by parents or tribe. Either a person is an Indian custodian or they are not. And let's take a look at the definition of that. 
Um, so I'm just going to pull ICWA right open. The state definition is exactly the same as the ICWA definition. An Indian custodian means any Indian person who has legal custody of an Indian child under tribal law or custom or under state law or to whom temporary physical care, custody, and control has been transferred by the parent of the child. All right. A person, when we become involved with a family, when DHS becomes involved in the family, either that person has that status or they do not. So it could be, it could be that they're a guardian. Let's say they have a, a probate guardianship. And in that case, they would have some kind of documentation or paperwork saying, hey, see, I'm the custodian. Um, and that's that's great. But that's not required. They don't have to have any kind of special paperwork. It might be that the parent, um, uh, you know, maybe that let, let's say the parent was incarcerated and uh, left the child with um, their mother and a power of attorney while they're going to be in custody for four months, right? And then that would make that person who is a member of a federally recognized Indian tribe the um, Indian custodian. But it could be way less formal than that. It does not require a lot of formality. It doesn't have to be any designation or paperwork or, or anything. It's, let's say, um, uh, so let's look at the definition again that or to whom custody, uh, physical care, custody, and control has been transferred by the parent of such child. So let's say mom is struggling with an addiction and she doesn't want to expose her child to that addiction. So she goes off on uh, binges of, you know, week, two weeks at a time, maybe a month at a time. And when she does, she leaves the child in the care of her mother or her sister, uh, people who are Indian people. So they are members of federally recognized Indian tribes um, who have physical care, custody, and control over the child that has been transferred to them by the mother when she goes off on her substance abuse jaunts. They are Indian custodians, even though there's nothing in writing. And there's, they, yeah, they don't have any legal relationship to the child. It's just sort of this informal transfer of uh, custody, care, and control of the child. They would be Indian custodians. So it can be pretty informal. But if the person does not have that status, they are, have not been granted legal custody under tribal law or customer under state law, and the parent has not transferred uh, physical care, custody, um, and control of the child to them. They're just, a, you know, let's say that mom hasn't seen her mother in five years, and and I, I keep using five years as my standard. I don't know why I'm doing that, but uh, and grandma has not uh, ever really cared for the child. Maybe he's visited, but that's the extent of it. Just visiting has never been in a responsibility of caring for the child and being responsible for the child. And we file a petition. Mom can't just say, "Well, I have a mom." And my mom's the Indian custodian. I'm going to designate her as the Indian custodian. You, you can't, we can't make up what the past has been. So e either grandma comes into the picture having that legal custody or having uh, all of that, you know, care, custody, control being transferred to her before we, the case was open. But if she didn't have that relationship with the child, then she's not an Indian custodian. Um, okay, uh, here's another question in the chat. I have a client who has a daughter whose Indian father is in jail. Um, she says the child is not enrolled and neither is father. Is there anything I should be aware of as a family coach for that mom and child? Okay. Um, so dad's not enrolled, child is not enrolled. Um, so one thing I would say is, I, I don't know what the which tribe it is. I would find out from the tribe first of all if they are willing or have a process for enrolling the child, even though the parents not enrolled. Um, I've we've I, I know a number of people who have been able to become enrolled even though their parent wasn't enrolled, including one of our sitting judges in Oregon who was able to. Uh, become enrolled with her tribe, even though her parents were not enrolled. Um, so uh, I would first ask that question and see if, because there, 
you know, that that's a tremendous benefit to the child to have that connection with her tribe. Um, so, uh, and then it says, you said, um, I only asked because there have been some visits to her by the local tribal representatives. Well, that's great. So that was gonna be my next point. So first of all, let's see if it's possible to uh, have that child enrolled uh, without the dad being enrolled. They may say no, and, it, and if they do, that's fine. That doesn't mean that the child can't build a meaningful connection with her tribal community. Um, and mom may need help uh, learning about and, and, and figuring out how to ensure that her, her child is connected to her tribal community. And so uh, I would, um, you know, if, if there's a way to sort of help foster a connection between the tribe and mom so that mom feels comfortable sort of bringing her child um, out and getting to know people and involving them in the community, I think that um, that would be really beneficial to this child. Um, but I suspect there are people on this call right now who have a lot better advice than I can provide as an attorney on that issue. Does anyone, would anyone like to weigh in on that question? I could connect with you later if you want, Bonnie. All right. Well, we're right at 12. Um, thank you all. I really appreciate all of your questions and your participation here today. Uh, and uh, Stacey, it was great to work with you today. Nice to see you. And thank I hope you to so get much. to, you are very welcome. I hope to get to work with all of you in the future. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you.